Welcome. Today's lecture is on the functional anatomy and pumping performance of the ventricular chambers of the heart. If we open the chest, retract the lungs, and resect the pericardium, you will see the chambers of the heart exposed. Here you see the outflow tract of the right ventricle. This is the right ventricular side of the heart. Here on the other side of this left anterior descending coronary artery is the left ventricular chamber. Uh, here you can see the right atrium, and up here a little bit of the left atrium. This is the pulmonary artery, and this is the aorta. Um, here you see the superior vena cava uh, that drains into the right atrium. We get a clearer picture in this cartoon. Here again we have the right ventricle. The inflow valve for the right ventricle is the tricuspid valve, and the inflow valve for the left ventricle is the mitral valve. The outflow from the left ventricle is through the aorta, and the outflow from the right ventricle through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery. That blood goes to the lungs and then returns via the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. The systemic blood flow through the aorta returns via the vena cava to the right atrium. The outer surface of the ventricles is known as the epicardium, and the inner surface is known as the endocardium. The common wall between the right ventricle and the left ventricle is known as the interventricular septum. The bottom of the heart is called the apex, and the top is called the base. And you'll notice that the left ventricular wall is thicker than the right ventricular wall. That's because while the left ventricle and the right ventricle are pumps in series that have to produce the same overall output, the right ventricle is pumping against the much lower resistance of the pulmonary circulation while the left ventricle has to generate about four times as much pressure to pump the same amount of blood through the systemic circulation, i.e. the rest of the body. The electrical conduction system uh, propagates an impulse that starts from the pacemaker at the sinoatrial node, spreads through the atrial tissue, uh, then is delayed at the atrioventricular node before it passes uh, into the ventricles via the Hispakinji system a high-speed conducting system that ramifies out to the inner surfaces of the left and right ventricular walls. From there, the electrical impulse propagates through the rest of the ventricular myocardium. Under normal conditions, this specialized conducting system ensures that the electrical activation of the ventricular walls is synchronous and fast enough that the time delays between the earliest and latest activated regions of ventricular walls are fairly small. They're not completely mechanically insignificant, but they're relatively small, except under disease conditions such as bundle branch block, where conduction defects can lead to dyssynchronous contraction and loss of mechanical efficiency. The coronary system of arteries and veins is so named because its pattern looks like a crown. So the left and right coronary arteries come straight off the aorta. They are the first circulations to be perfused in the systemic circulation. The left main coronary artery quickly bifurcates into the left circumflex coronary artery, which travels around the base of the left ventricle, and the left anterior descending coronary artery, which follows down the border between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. The right coronary artery follows around the base of the right ventricle. Other major arteries of the coronary artery system include the uh, diagonal branches of the left anterior descending coronary artery. And not shown in this diagram, there's also a septal artery. This system is necessary to ensure that all parts of the ventricular walls are well perfused with oxygenated blood because cardiac muscle depends exclusively on oxidative phosphorylation for the energy supply that it needs to keep pumping. Most of the coronary blood flow occurs during the diastolic phase of the cardiac cycle when the driving pressure is lower, but the stress in the wall is much lower. Every other circulation in the body receives higher flows during the systolic phase when the driving pressure is higher. This diagram, sometimes known as the Wiggers diagram, shows the main events during a single cardiac cycle. Starting at the end of the filling phase, when the ventricles are most full, shortly after the electrical impulse travels through the ventricular myocardium, contraction initiates and the pressure starts to rise. And as soon as the pressure rises, 
the pressure in the ventricles exceeds the pressure in the atria, causing the inflow tricuspid and mitral valves to close. So the first phase of the cardiac cycle is known as isovolumic contraction because the valves are all closed and the volume is constant, but the pressure is rising quickly. Once the pressure in the ventricles exceeds the pressure in the aorta or pulmonary artery, then the aortic and pulmonic valves open and the ventricles begin to eject into the arteries. And this phase, while the pressure is still rising for a while, is called ejection. Eventually, the blood flow decelerates, and that deceleration reverses the pressure gradient across the outflow valves, causing the valves to close. At that point, now the heart muscle is beginning to relax, and all the valves are again closed, and so the pressure falls with no change in volume. So phase three is called isovolumic relaxation. When the ventricles are fully relaxed, they're now actually at a volume that is below the resting equilibrium volume of the ventricle. So their pressure will fall below that of the atria, and the inflow valves will open. But because the ventricles have contracted down to below the equilibrium volume in a normal heart, they will actually start to spring open. And so while the pressure is still falling, the volume will rise. And then, and this is the early rapid stage of diastolic filling. Finally, in the later phase of diastole, the atria contract to give a little extra kick to the filling of the ventricles. And this phase is known as diastasis. Also on this diagram are the heart sounds that can be heard by a physician corresponding to the valve uh, opening and closure events. The action potential showing the depolarization corresponding to the QRS complex of the electrocardiogram and the repolarization corresponding to the T wave of the electrocardiogram. And you notice that the onset of systole, the onset of isovolumic contraction, is shortly after the peak of the QRS complex. So those are the four phases of the cardiac cycle, isovolumic contraction, ejection, isovolumic relaxation, and filling which consists of early filling and late filling or diastasis. We often hear these phases referred to as two phases, systole and diastole, where systole consists of isovolumic contraction and ejection, and diastole consists of isovolumic relaxation and filling. Though it would be a mistake to think that diastole represents the state of the heart where the muscle is not at all active. Uh, in particular, isovolumic relaxation is the state in which the muscle is relaxing, not in which it's fully relaxed. However, overall, at normal cardiac rates at rest, two-thirds of the cardiac cycle is diastole and only about one-third is systole. However, when we exercise and the heart rate increases, the diastolic interval shortens. The length of the systolic interval doesn't change very much. Here is another view of the phases of the cardiac cycle in the Wiggers diagram that also includes the volumes. So again, we can see that during the late phase, uh, diastasis phase of filling, the pressure is not rising very much. There's a little bump uh, during atrial systole, and the volume is rising slowly. Then, shortly after the peak of the R wave, the valves close, and the pressure starts to rise rapidly while the volume is constant, so that's isovolumic contraction, until the ventricular pressure exceeds the, in this case, in the left ventricle, the aortic pressure, and we get aortic valve opening. After the aortic valve opens, during the ejection phase, the volume is falling rapidly at first and then more slowly inside the ventricle. And the pressures in the aorta and the ventricle are approximately the same because the valve is opened. And the valves remain open until the flow decelerates and the pressure gradient across the aortic valve reverses, at which point we get aortic valve closure. Now the valves are closed and the muscles are relaxing, so the pressure is falling rapidly, but the volume is now constant. And so this is isovolumic relaxation. This little blip in the pressure tracing measured in the aorta is called the dicrotic notch. It's not per se an effect of the valve closure itself. However, it is a result of the valves being closed because pressure waves propagating along the arterial system also uh, reflected back 
And when they bounce off the closed valve, they produce this dichrotic notch in the aortic pressure signal. At the end of isovolumic relaxation, when the pressure in the ventricle falls below the atrial pressure, the mitral valve opens. But as I mentioned, the volume is below the equilibrium volume, and so the pressure actually continues to fall even as the ventricle fills rapidly. So this is a suction type of effect. And then the pressure starts to rise as the volume rises more slowly during the diastasis phase of the cardiac cycle. This plot also shows the pressure measured in the aorta. And you can see that whilst the ventricular pressure varies from between 1 kilopascal and 15 or 16 kilopascals, the aortic pressure only varies between about 10 kilopascals and 16 kilopascals. This is very important, and it's primarily a consequence of the valves themselves and the uh, compliance of the aorta. So when you hear about a systolic and diastolic blood pressure, these represent arterial pressures, and this pressure here of about 10 kilopascals or 80 millimeters of mercury is what would be referred to as your diastolic blood pressure. But don't confuse that diastolic blood pressure with the diastolic ventricular pressure, which would be much lower. On the other hand, your systolic blood pressure, about 120 millimeters of mercury, and the peak pressure developed by the left ventricle are the same. Now this plot shows pressure versus time and volume versus time. But it's very useful to use a phase plane in which we plot pressure versus volume. And in the pressure volume plane, the cardiac cycle becomes a loop with the four phases that we mentioned representing the four sides of the loop and the valve opening and closure events representing the corners. So during filling, the pressure is low and the mitral valve is open, so the volume is increasing. At the point of the R wave when the mitral valve closes, the pressure rises rapidly and the volume doesn't change, and so this is isovolumic contraction which continues until the aortic valve opens, at which point the pressure continues to rise for a while and then fall, but the volume is falling until the flow deceleration causes the pressure gradient to reverse across the aortic valve. In the case of the left ventricle, the aortic valve closes, and now the pressure is falling and the volume is constant, and this is the isovolumic relaxation phases. So isovolumic contraction is the vertical line corresponding to the most filled stage of the heart, and isovolumic relaxation is the vertical line corresponding to the isovolumic phase during the most empty phase of the cycle. The bottom right corner at the point of mitral valve closure is the end of diastole and the start of systole. The top left corner at the point of aortic valve closure is the end of systole and the start of diastole. So these two phases here are systole, these two phases here are diastole the loop progresses in a counterclockwise direction. And there are other interesting and useful uh, readouts from this view. For example, the width of the pressure volume loop represents the difference between the most filled volume, the end diastolic volume, and the most emptied volume, the end systolic volume, and is called the stroke volume. The stroke volume can be used to calculate the ejection fraction, which is the ratio of the stroke volume to the end diastolic volume. A typical ejection fraction is about 70%. Another useful insight that comes from the pressure volume diagram is that the area of the pressure volume loop represents the external work, the integral of the pressure with respect to volume over the cardiac cycle, represents the stroke work or external work that the ventricle has done on the blood that it ejected. Now, stroke work is important because it relates to the energy requirements of the ventricular muscle which in turn relates to the oxygen consumption of the ventricular muscle or myocardium. Since 95% of the ATP in cardiac muscle cells is normally produced by aerobic metabolism or oxidative phosphorylation, myocardial oxygen consumption, known as MVO2, is often used to determine the cardiac energy utilization and can be obtained by multiplying the coronary blood flow by the measured difference between the oxygen in the arterial and venous coronary blood. So myocardial oxygen consumption is coronary blood flow times the arteriovenous oxygen concentration difference. While the energy generated by the oxidation of a mole of substrate varies with the substrate, whether it's, for example, glucose or fatty acid, the energy generated per unit of oxygen is fairly constant and is actually similar to that for glucose and lactate, about 20 joules per mil of oxygen.
the external work is related to the regional work that's done by the muscle. So the regional work is the integral of the stress times the strain. But notice there's a minus sign here because this is a work being done by the muscle. Or it's the active contractile tension times the length change uh, of the sarcomeres as a one-dimensional approximation. Again, there should be a minus sign here because the positive active contractile tension produces a negative length change in ejecting the blood, a shortening of the muscle. In the 1970s, Suger was interested in the relationship between the myocardial oxygen consumption and the work done by the heart and contraction. But he also realized that there was an elastic potential energy generated by the heart during an isovolumic contraction. In other words, generated during a contraction in which the volume was clamped and the heart couldn't actually eject anything. So therefore it was doing no work, but it was still expending mechanical energy. He realized that this pressure development required metabolic energy, even though it did no external work. It must be dissipated instead as heat. And so he defined the pressure volume area as the sum of the external work and this potential energy, this work that might have been done um, associated with an isovolumic contraction. So the pressure volume area is the sum of the potential energy in this triangle plus the external energy in this loop. He then plotted the myocardial oxygen consumption versus the pressure volume area and found a surprisingly linear relationship with an offset. So Suga further divided this offset into a basal oxygen consumption required just to keep the heart alive even when it's not beating, and an activation energy that increases with the contractility and heart rate and is mainly the energy involved in calcium cycling and uh, activation of the contractile machinery. He defined the excess oxygen consumption as the oxygen consumption minus the basal and activation energies. And he saw that this excess oxygen consumption varied with the pressure volume area in a way that was independent of the state of activation of the muscle. So whether the muscle was contracting strongly or weakly, all that mattered was the pressure volume area that it produced in determining the oxygen consumption. These definitions give rise to several ways of thinking about the efficiency of energy utilization by the heart. For example, we can define the mechanical efficiency as the external work divided by the total myocardial oxygen consumption. The conversion efficiency is the pressure volume area divided by the total myocardial oxygen consumption. And the myofibrillar efficiency is the pressure volume area divided by the myocardial oxygen consumption minus the unloaded myocardial oxygen consumption. In other words, this is the slope of the pressure volume area myocardial oxygen consumption curve. By these definitions, the conversion efficiency is about 20 to 30 percent. The myofibrillar efficiency is about 30 to 40 percent. There are other ways to define efficiency by considering the mechanics of isolated muscle, but they're generally consistent with these definitions. So the pressure volume loop is a useful way of looking at the energetics of cardiac pumping, but we can also learn more from it. Imagine we have the pressure volume loop of a control beat in the left ventricle under certain conditions of loading. If we increase the filling of the ventricle or the end diastolic pressure, then we will also increase the end diastolic volume along a relationship known as the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. And this is called increasing the preload on the heart. What we find is those pressure volume loops, if we didn't change the afterload, the blood pressure against which the ventricle was contracting, that the ventricle would contract back to about the same end systolic point, meaning that the stroke volume and the area of the pressure volume loop will increase as the preload increases. And this turns out to be a very fundamental property of cardiac contraction that's referred to as the Starling's law or the Frank Starling mechanism. The more you increase the filling of the heart, the more it ejects. If instead we were to decrease the afterload or the blood pressure against which the ventricle was contracting while keeping the filling pressure, the end diastolic pressure and volume constant, then this time we would see that 
for lower afterloads, it would be easier for the ventricle to contract, and so it would eject more against the lower load. So the heart can eject more stroke volume either by contracting against a lower afterload or being filled to a higher preload. But notice that while filling to a higher preload increases the stroke volume and increases the stroke work, decreasing the afterload increases the stroke volume but decreases the height of the loop, and so it doesn't necessarily increase the stroke work that's been done. In contrast, if we increase the afterload, then the loop would be taller but narrower, and the stroke volume would go down. If we decrease the preload, then the loop would be narrower, and the stroke work and volume would be decreased. You'll notice that in order to draw these new loops, we relied on these dotted lines. So I mentioned that the end diastolic pressure volume relation represents the curve of points connecting pressure and volume at end diastole. And this curve is primarily determined by the geometry and resting material properties of the myocardium. It represents the pressure volume relation that would be obtained if the heart was in an end diastolic state and we simply increased the pressure. The end systolic pressure volume relation represents the relationship between the pressure and the volume at end systole when the ventricular walls are maximally contracted. Note that this line tends to be approximately linear, but its slope can change as a function of the state of activation of the muscle. So one thing we've learned from the pressure volume loop is that as we increase the preload, the end diastolic volume or end diastolic pressure, we increase the stroke volume and the stroke work. And this observation was first reported by Ernest Starling in the early 20th century and is known as Starling's law of the heart, or more commonly these days, the Frank Starling mechanism in recognition of the contributions of Otto Frank, who was the first person to plot the pressure volume diagram in 1899. So the stroke work versus the preload is sometimes known as the Starling's curve. And you notice that in a normal heart, the higher the preload, the higher the stroke work. Now it's possible to change the Starling curve. For example, if we increase the contractility of the heart muscle, perhaps by giving an adrenergic agonist like isoproterenol, the stroke work curve will move up. If we decrease the contractility, for example, by making the heart ischemic or putting it into heart failure, then the stroke work will decrease and the Starling curve will shift down. So this suggests that the position of the Starling curve represents another important property of the myocardium, which is its contractility, or sometimes known as its inotropy or inotropic state. Another way to look at contractility or inotropic state is to look at the end systolic pressure volume relation. Increased contractility increases the slope of the end systolic pressure volume relation. Decreased contractility decreases the slope of the end systolic pressure volume relation. So now knowing how the pressure volume loop depends on the end diastolic and end systolic pressure volume relations, we can now predict not only how the stroke volume and stroke work will be affected by changes in the preload and the afterload, but also by changes in contractility. There are also factors that can affect the end diastolic pressure volume relation. For example, if the myocardium becomes stiffer, perhaps due to fibrosis, then the end diastolic pressure volume relation will move to the left. If the left ventricle becomes dilated or thinned, then the end diastolic pressure volume relation will move to the right. This view of contractility and the pressure volume loop, emphasizing the importance of the end diastolic and end systolic pressure volume relations, is also a useful way of understanding the relationship between the pumping performance of the chambers and the underlying mechanical properties of the heart muscle. Because as we'll see later, there are very similar curves for the tension in the cardiac muscle versus the length of cardiac muscle, both when the muscle is resting or passive, and this curve looks like the end diastolic pressure volume relation, and when the curve is active or contracting, and this curve looks a bit like the end systolic pressure volume relation. This curve of the peak tension developed by cardiac muscle as a function of length, notice is also modulated by the amount of calcium in the cells, which is a regulator of contractility. So changing the amount of calcium and therefore changing the peak isometric developed tension is analogous to changing the slope of the end systolic pressure volume relation. Now a useful feature of the end systolic pressure volume relation is that it's fairly well approximated by a straight line. But it turns out that straight line can also be plotted for other phases of the cardiac cycle during systole. 
So if, for example, we have a variety of different loops measured under different loading conditions, and we plot the pressure and volume instantaneously during systole at different phases of systole, assuming here the same heart rate. So here are all the points on each of these four loops at 80 milliseconds, here at 120, here at 160 milliseconds, and here at end systole at 200 milliseconds after end diastole. You can see that at each of these phases, the pressure volume relationship is also well approximated by a straight line. And so this observation by Suga and Sagawa in the 70s gave rise to the concept of time varying elastance, namely that during systole, the heart muscle behaves very much like a time varying instantaneous pressure volume relation. And the slope of that pressure volume relation is characterized by a quantity called E, the elastance, that is maximum at end systole. So the slope of the end systolic pressure volume relationship is also often called E max. So here we see some real data plotting instantaneous pressure volume relationships during isovolumic contraction, ejection, and isovolumic relaxation. Plotting the slope of these curves during the cardiac cycle, we get the elastance as a function of time, and this is the so-called time-varying elastance. So this is a very useful view of cardiac pump function because in spite of the complexities of cardiac muscle contractile properties, at the level of the whole chamber, the ventricles behave as time-varying elastances where the pressure volume ratio at any phase of the cardiac cycle is constant and changes as a function of time reaching a maximum at end systole. Notice that the approximation is also made that the intercept of the pressure volume relation uh, V0 is constant and this turns out to be a fairly good approximation. So this allows the simple model that the instantaneous pressure in the ventricle is equal to the instantaneous elastance times the instantaneous volume minus V0. Now, of course, time varying elastance is only an approximation. And under the time varying elastance theory, it wouldn't matter what kind of beat we had, whether it was a non-ejecting isovolumic beat or an ejecting beat or an unusual beat like this so-called oxobaric beat all of them would exactly fall between the end diastolic and end systolic pressure volume relations. Well, it turns out that that's a good approximation, but it's not a perfect approximation. So comparing, for example, in the same heart, isovolumic beats, so beats in which the volume of the left ventricle was kept constant, and make the end systolic pressure volume relation and end diastolic pressure volume relations and the instantaneous elastance curves from these data, and compare them to the instantaneous elastance curves you get from a so-called oxobaric beat. So an oxobaric beat is one in which the heart is contracting against a column of fluid, and as it contracts, it pushes the fluid up, which increases the pressure. But there's no valve action, so you don't get perfect isovolumic phases. In these two experiments, you can see that the end systolic points and the end diastolic points fall closely, but not exactly, on the same relationship. If we plot the time-varying elastance curves, for these two different experiments, you can see that they are very similar for the individual case or on average of a number of animals, but they're not identical. At some phases of the cardiac cycle, such as here, there are positive effects of shortening that occurs in the oxobaric contraction, uh, whereas in others, there are negative effects of shortening. In other words, the pressure generated during the shortening beat is lower than that generated during an isovolumic beat. But the differences you see here give you an indication of the relatively small magnitude of the error in the approximation associated with the time varying elastance theory. This is another experiment comparing isovolumic beats, which is this line here, with variably preloaded beats, so ejecting beats in which the preload was varied, and that gives rise to this second end systolic pressure volume relation, or variably afterloaded beats, in which the afterload was altered, and those gave rise to this end systolic pressure volume relation. So you can see that these three different types of loading conditions do not give an identical end systolic pressure volume relation, in this case differing by as much as 15 to 20 percent. So that again is another estimate of the degree of accuracy of the time varying elastance approximation. What this study also shows is that the more the ejection, and so the greater the shortening, the greater the decrease in pressure versus isovolumic. So there tends to be a deactivating effect of shortening or ejection compared with an isovolumic beat.
So this deactivation is not accounted for in the time varying elastance theorem. Various extensions to the time varying elastance model have been proposed, including those models that include inertial effects of the acceleration of the blood, so that would be a mass added to the spring system, viscous resistance of the resistance to blood flow, and deactivating effects due to shortening. So here, for example, we have a model that includes an inertial effect and a viscous effect in addition to the time varying elastance. However, these models tell us more about the dynamics of the ejection of the heart into the circulation than they do about the intrinsic properties of the heart muscle itself, which will be the topic of our next discussion. So in summary, in this lecture on ventricular function, we've seen that ventricular anatomy is three-dimensional and complex, that systole consists of isovolumic contraction and ejection phases, while diastole consists of the isovolumic relaxation and filling phases. The area of the pressure volume loop is the ventricular stroke work or external work, and the stroke work increases with filling. This is Starling's law or the Frank Starling mechanism. Myocardial oxygen consumption is proportional to pressure volume area, which is the external work plus the potential energy, and the ventricles behave approximately like time varying elastances. The slope of the end systolic pressure volume relation is a load independent measure of contractility or inotropic state, and it's called Emax. Next time we'll talk about the structure and mechanics of cardiac muscle.